So welcome to our Teams Nation session, adopting Microsoft 365 Copilot, Advantages and Challenges. My name is Dino Caputo, and joining me today are my fellow Canadian MVPs, Curtis Johnstone, Michael Lamontagne, and Habib Mankel. So we run a podcast called O365A, and we talk about all things Microsoft 365, and we publish uh, fairly regularly on a variety of topics. So you can check us out at O365A.com um, for all things M M365 and Copilot. Uh, as well. So in terms of an agenda, um, we're going to cover off preparing for considerations for adopting and the value assessment of Copilot. But before I kick things off uh, with um, the, pre the preparing and prerequisites for Copilot, we should take a second to understand uh, what Copilot for Microsoft 365 is. There's a lot of confusion surrounding Copilot. I'm sure many of you on the call and uh, listening to a lot of sessions today are confused about uh, Copilot in general. I know we were certainly uh, confused when it when it came out. And like anything shiny and new, there's there's going to be confusion. So Michael's going to help us out and cut through the confusion of um, uh, Copilot. So over to you, Michael. Yeah, I mean, hopefully everyone has heard about Copilot by now. Uh, but if there is some confusion on what Copilot is, uh, Copilot is Microsoft infusing AI or artificial intelligence in every product, right? So that's from GitHub to Viva, security, uh, Power Platform, and the Microsoft 365 stack. Uh, so today we'll be focusing on Copilot for Microsoft 365. Uh, which brings AI to our productivity tools like Teams, Outlook, and other Office applications. So if we kind of talk about the advantage side, because I, I know we have a lot on, on the challenges and getting, getting Copilot in, uh, but some of the advantages, uh, first start with the fear. Uh, you know, the, a great quote from over a year ago was, you know, AI will not replace you, a person with AI will. Um, I think if we go further, you know, if you're an organization in a competitive industry and you're not using AI, uh, you can start to be at a disadvantage when competing uh, against those that are. So uh, some of the big advantages, and, and I know there's some buzzwords on here, you know, time savings, uh, you know, supercharging productivity and creativity. Um, you know, some of those scenarios, you know, if you've ever been added to a long email chain with a comment of like, hey, can you respond to the blow? Uh, you could you could use Copilot to basically summarize the thread, uh, get you up to speed quickly versus kind of reading through all the different chain uh, items. Uh, simply, you know, responding to an email and use Copilot to say, you know, take take what I wrote, put a professional spin on the, on that uh, that tone uh, for my reply. Some other scenarios, intelligent uh, meeting recap has been a, a lifesaver for me. Uh, this is working, you know, I work on multiple projects. You know, getting a quick summary of the discussion and the, the key action items. Uh, you know, I've been on countless workshops presenting for hours, and then at the end, the customer is like, can you send me uh, a list of action items? And so, you know, I'm really bad at taking notes while I'm presenting and demoing. You know, they may be chicken scratches as I'm going. So then at the end of that, I have to, you know, try and make those notes presentable to a customer, but hey, I'm already five minutes late for my next meeting. So, you know, at the end of the day, you have all these meetings that you have to kind of review, remember the context and, and, and deal with all those notes and, and getting those to your customers. So for me, you know, using Copilot, you know, getting, you know, quickly get the recap, copy, paste, uh, review it, adjust it, and then quickly hit send, uh, countless time saving there. And then I struggle with, you know, kind of the blank page syndrome. Uh, I have to create a lot of decision documents, uh, design documents, and so it takes me a little bit to get the you know the first few ideas on the page, and then after that I can kind of go off to the races. So I usually use like Copilot to you know either take a Word document, convert it to a PowerPoint, or even generating topics or the table of contents or an executive summary, just so that there's some text on the page that you can start manipulating, adjusting before going forward. <clears throat> Nice. Uh, thanks for that, Michael. 
So now we can kind of dive into the uh, prereqs for Copilot. So obviously uh, you need to have the Microsoft 365 apps deployed so that you can interact with Copilot right from all your favorite apps like Teams, Word, Excel, and, and PowerPoint. So that's going to be your first step. All of the update channels support Copilot, except for the semi-annual enterprise update channel. So check these settings if you're not seeing Copilot. And if you're not familiar with the update channels, that those are what you can set in your admin center, in the Microsoft admin center, to control the cadence of new updates in terms of all the Office apps. So um, they refer to as update channels. So um, have a look at those before you dive down the path of Copilot. Obviously, you're going to need to apply licenses to users. Um, so if you're a large org, Azure-based uh, group-based licenses makes this super easy for you. You can just add it to the existing group that you're already uh, potentially using for users, and you can apply the Copilot license there. Or if you're a smaller org, you can just apply the licenses uh, directly, just like any other license. Um, consider assigning some of the users to the preview and beta channels. Um, those, those channels will show you um, some of the new updates that might be coming down for Copilot, anything new that's being introduced by Microsoft, which um, likely will be fast and furious in the next uh, coming weeks and months. So if you want to expose and get ahead of some of those features uh, before the masses of your organization, you can just uh, you know, set users into the preview and beta channels, which will show those new updates. In terms of licensing, um, we're going to need as a starting point, any of the uh, E3, E5, A3, A5, business standard or premium licenses to start with. So if you don't have those licenses, you won't be able to use Copilot, Microsoft Copilot for 365 anyway. There's other Copilots you can get, but in terms of 365 Microsoft Copilot for 365, you'll need to start at that base level. So those retail about $30 USD uh, per user per month, and that's going to be an annual commitment. So you won't be able to pay monthly. So you, once you decide to go down this path, you're looking at 360 US dollars um, per user. And once again, um, this is going to get you the integration with you know, all the Office apps, uh, Teams, Word, Outlook, PowerPoint, Excel, and any of the uh, other Office and 365 apps as well, including the AI Power Chat with Copilot at, that you get at copilot.microsoft.com. Um, in terms of, there's a couple other things we we're showing here. Uh, Bing Chat Enterprise, um, now called Microsoft Copilot, not to be confused with Microsoft 365 Copilot. Um, that's free with any of these 365 subscriptions. And lastly, if you want to leverage Copilot Studio, which allows you to build your own custom Copilots, you'll need to purchase an add-on license, uh, which is usage-based and it's 200 USD per month. And it allows you for 25,000 messages or interactions with the bot that you create per month. Um, if you want to learn more about Copilot Studio, we, we just recently did a podcast actually where Curtis runs through some demos um, on Copilot Studio. So check it out on our, our, on our YouTube channel. Um, I want to talk about the guided setup. So Microsoft's done a nice job creating these guided setups in the M365 Admin Center. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have seen them, but you should check them out. Basically, anything you can deploy in Microsoft 365, they've created a guided setup. So if you're like totally super new to doing any kind of M365 administration, you could use these guided setups to help you step through all the things you need to do to get something enabled. And so they've provided these step-by-step -step instructions um, for Copilot. So just you can take a look at admin.microsoft.com under setup, and then it's apps and email. And you'll see something called get ready for Microsoft 365, co uh, Microsoft Copilot for, for Microsoft 365. So while the setup is limited to just licensing your users and emailing them and from an actual, like what's it actually doing, it steps through all the different summaries of what to expect with Copilot. 
when you're deploying it. And it does a great job summarizing all the Microsoft Learn links that you'll need to review as an admin um, on your journey to deploying uh, Copilot. The process will also, uh, when it emails the users, it'll send them a nice summary of all the things that you need to expect when using Copilot as well. So that's pretty <coughs> good. So I'd urge you to check that out. Right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Kurt to talk a little bit about which uh, users to consider to enable for Copilot. Yeah, thanks Dino. So uh, once you've covered off the prerequisites, you have the licenses, it comes time to deploy this in your organization. Um, Copilot for Microsoft 365 is no different than rolling out uh, new licenses and new features uh, for other workloads that you've done before. And probably the first step uh, is you want to identify those first users, users you're going to make a license plan for to deploy these capabilities to. Uh, with Copilot, because there's a cost associated with it and it's uh, a whole new set of capabilities, um, a really good way to do it is to deploy it to a set of POC users, maybe a couple of different groups, um, measure their challenges, their usage, their impact. And uh, when we look at uh, what type of users will benefit the most for this um, set of capabilities, we really want to identify users that have that are number one active in your existing Microsoft 365 applications and using the types of activities in those applications that lend itself well to Copilot. So Microsoft has made available a set of reports um, in the Microsoft 365 admin portal. They're in the same area where all the other usage reports are. And they provide a couple of uh, really useful um, insights into who we should make these licenses available to. So first up, at a tenant, tenant level, there's a really nice um, aggregate total summary of the number of users that are active in specific workloads in your tenant that will benefit from Copilot. So uh, you'll see in the upper right hand um, uh, screenshot there, uh, this is a really small tenant, but it, it shows the number of users who have actively used Teams meetings, Teams chats, Outlook email, and the Office docs like Word, PowerPoint. And those are the types of workloads that really um, lend themselves well to uh, benefit from Copilot. And then in terms of specific users, we look at identifying to have this license. The bottom half of the report actually shows which users have been active in Microsoft 365, whether they've been assigned a Copilot license, whether they're in the eligible channel to receive the Copilot capabilities, and then also it will identify whether they've been active in those specific workloads like Teams meetings, Teams chats, Outlook email. So it's a, a really useful way to get a list of specific users that are eligible to use these Copilot capabilities. And just a couple of quick important notes about um, this report. So the bottom half, which gives you the specific users um, that are eligible and good candidates, um, Microsoft introduced a change about, I think it was about four or five years ago, where those usernames in all the usage reports are concealed. They're replaced with a, an obfuscated number. Um, and that by default is on. So you need to go into your report settings and turn that off if you want to see the uh, individual usernames. And that was done for privacy reasons. Um, another setting in those report settings that's worth uh, turning on is you can expose this usage data to, to Microsoft Power BI, the, uh, I think the settings called Microsoft 365 Usage Analytics, and that will allow you to use some really nifty Power BI dashboards that are pre-built for Microsoft to get even more insights on readiness and adoption for Copilot for Microsoft 365. And we'll look at that a bit later. So, um, once you've uh, established a license plan and, and you're ready to go, uh, we'll shift gears a bit and it's worth talking a little bit about uh, everyone's favorite topic, privacy, security, and governance. Um, so we could spend a whole session talking about this and uh, you know, we'll, we don't have a full hour to dedicate, it, dedicate to it. So I just wanna cover off a couple of really key high level points in regards to this topic. 
Uh, first and foremost, know that the existing commitments that Microsoft has made in your Microsoft 365 tenant around privacy, security, and commitment, they hold true for the usage of Copilot for Microsoft 365. And that's a pretty significant um, statement and reassurance because basically um, Microsoft has spent a lot of investment, a lot of calories in ensuring that the data within Microsoft 365 is compliant, it's secure, it, uh, it obeys the, the privacy laws in place in most countries. So that's your starting point and that's a, a really good place to start. Um, in terms of prompts, responses and data provided to Copilot, um, Copilot uses uh, organization or organizational data stored in your Microsoft Graph, and uh, it's a common misconception and a common fear that that data could be used to train foundational large language models that Copilot uses. That uh, that is not true. So uh, your organizational data will not be used to train these LLMs unless you explicitly consented to do so. Um, I think that's a common fear because there's. There's been a couple of high profile cases in the media where the use of public large language models like ChatGPT has exposed some user data to, to the LLMs to be trained. Um, so it's worth noting that Microsoft is very explicit uh, on that point that they don't use your data for that purpose. Um, because organizational data is used, it's worth um, considering whether your data ever leaves your Microsoft 365 service boundary. Um, so generally, the usage of your data and Copilot stays within your tenant boundary, and there's two exceptions. So one, if you allow Copilot uh, to use your graph grounded chat data to reference web content, in some cases, uh, the, the query that's sent to Microsoft Bing for that web content could use some of your organizational data. And there's a bunch of ifs and ends and criteria around that. So Microsoft has a whole article entitled Copilot for Microsoft 365 and Web Content. So you can check that out to figure out which scenarios uh, specifically that applies to. Another scenario where organizational data could leave your service boundary is if you use Copilot plugins, and there's many of them. Uh, plugins um, extend the capabilities of Copilot and uh, what you have to do there is check your privacy statements in terms of use and conditions for that plugin to know whether uh, your organizational data could leave the boundary. Um, one other area in terms of um, compliance and, and data governance you might want to think about is uh, the, the data about user interactions. It is stored by Microsoft. Uh, these would be user interactions um, when a user uses Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, the data is encrypted while it's stored. And again, it's not used to train any large language foundational model. Um, you can view this uh, stored data and you can even control the retention of it through Microsoft Purview. So if that's of interest to you, you you'll want to check out more details around that. Um, in terms of data sovereignty, um, Basically, Copilot uses uh, a large language model service in Azure uh, in the closest regional data center. And it's really important to point out that for uh, European Union customers, any EU traffic stays within the EU data boundary. So that's a, that's a great reassurance for Microsoft. Uh, lastly, let's talk about permissions for a minute. Um, it's sort of a common misconception that uh, Copilot might surface data that a user didn't have access to. Uh, that's that's not true. Uh, basically, um, Microsoft 365 only surfaces organizational data that a user has view access to, minimum view access. Um, but uh, to talk more about that from a sensitive data perspective, uh, Dino is going to dive into that and specifically talk about uh, you know the potential for oversharing. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. So when we're considering um, when we're deploying Copilot, we need to consider sensitive data. So if the data, you know, as Kurt just talked about, um, in your org is not properly secured, then Copilot's going to make it really easy to find. So there's a few things you can do to assist um, you on your journey to, you know, help you secure this data. So first off, you can use 
purview to help you uh, apply built-in or custom classifications on your data so that sensitive data is tagged with like personal or financial or confidential. And then you can apply policies um, and you can set up these policies to restrict access to those types of documents that are uh, tagged accordingly. Um, when talking about, just, just simply speaking, when talking about uh, the org level at the Teams and SharePoint uh, online settings, you can adjust those levers to control, you know, maybe maybe org had guest access enabled and it's it's got, you know, lots of sharing um, permissions enabled. So you can use those master levers to control um, what's going on in terms of sharing. So um, that's an easy place to start as well. And you should think about performing SharePoint site audits as well to ensure that your SharePoint sites are only shared with users within your org, for example. Um, and if you need to, sh to share externally, um, make sure that that list is kept current. So if you've got contractors or externals that are coming in and helping you, um, limit that list, make sure it's reviewed um, frequently so that you're, you're keeping it up to date and no one's uh, no one's in that list that shouldn't be. So there's some good SharePoint scripts on GitHub that you can search for that will help you get insights into where data might be exposed. So these scripts you can run and basically will analyze the entire uh, SharePoint site and then dump out all the permissions in terms of who's got access. So that's super useful if you've got a lot of sites and document libraries. And so lastly, um, you can use Microsoft Syntax to help you automate finding document oversharing. Um, Syntax can leverage sensitivity labels that you may have already created in your content models um, and help apply those labels to the documents you're creating. So if you've already taken the time to go through your governance policies and, and have deployed classifications and sensitivity labels, then um, this can be super useful. Um, a little bit on auto labeling uh, as well. This can this can help. So just to focus on this a bit more, um, auto labeling can be important because you you don't need to train your users uh, when to use each of these classifications. So you you know you can suggest to them which labels to use based on a document they might be creating. So that that can be helpful. Um, so you don't need to rely on the users to classify all the content. Uh, correctly. So if you use automation with syntax, this takes it out of their hands. So if we're, if you're worried about the users, you know, making the wrong, the wrong choice, then you can use automation to help uh, label the documents correctly. And so why this is, is super important is because users don't have to worry about, okay, well, which policy am I supposed to apply? Um, they can just focus on doing their job and not worrying about um, labeling documents, which um, you know, it's kind of a, a boring task and secondary to the user. They're, they're there to complete their tasks. Um, lastly, um, if you've got massive amounts of data uh, and you haven't done any kind of labeling, so you just got like a ton of data to deal with, you can use something called service side labeling, which will label all your data at rest. And that's going to be super beneficial. Again, you've got, you haven't done any of this governance work you've got massive amounts of documents and you don't know where to start, the auto labeling um, can basically um, help you get a, a, at least an initial pass down on all your documents and it'll go through and um, detect, okay, this, this got financial data in it, so I'm gonna mark it as financial, this may have salaries, that type of thing. So you don't, you know, that can be a super helpful uh, uh, feature to use to, to get started. So Dino, just before, just before we move on to the demo, there's a question in the chat. So maybe you can answer it's just on the governance. Um, so the question is, do you see the controls to limit the access for semantic index slash copilot for specific data labels or site collection? I.e. before the first copilot license uh, is installed or just after the license has arrived in the tenant. So I think I think you're asking if it's better to turn this on before the first copilot license is deployed? I, I mean, yeah, I yeah. The answer, the answer would be yes. I mean, again, um, 
if nothing is secured in your tenant and you deploy Copilot, it's just going to make it super easy to, to find things, which I'm about to show. Um, so here's an example of, you know, me interacting um, with Copilot. And I wanted to demonstrate, you know, on this point of governance, why it's so important to address this before you roll out Copilot. So um, here you can see I'm in Teams and I've asked Copilot to show me all the Excel files in the tenant um, to which it obliges and it finds three Excel files which I was not aware existed or may not have found just by randomly searching in Teams or SharePoint. So you can see how easy it is to um, search an entire tenant for content right from, right from the Copilot search in Teams. Um, another example, you know, I'm like, hey, Copilot, find me the files that contain salary info in them. And Copilot does its thing and searches the tenant and finds an Excel file called a datum, um, which sounds pretty boring and probably not a file that I would have bothered looking at if I happened to see it, like searching in SharePoint or just through Teams files. But because I prompted Copilot to look for files with salary information, um, I'm definitely going to open this one because it found something and, you know, um, I can even ask it to summarize the tape, the, the file in a nice table for me, which it does. So I don't even have to open the file. It just summarizes all the, you know, the CEO, CTO's salary information here. So obviously it's a bit of an extreme example, but if this file just happened to live in a SharePoint site and it wasn't secured, you just made it super easy to find, uh, using Copilot. So again, before you enable Copilot, uh, make sure you've secured all your data, go through some of that governance uh, process. If you haven't gone through it, it's probably a good time to start up a project to um, get, your, get your governance data uh, in order. So on that note, over to you, Michael, to um, discuss adopting Copilot. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to remember we're talking about co-pilot, not, not autopilot. So there is a person interacting with the AI. So how do we get our users not only using it, but also using it effectively in their days? So uh, lots of resources out there. Uh, Microsoft has published uh, on the adoption.microsoft.com. Uh, a lot of content specific for Copilot, so that there's a Copilot onboarding toolkit. It has a communication plan in it. It's like a zip file that has a communication plan, email templates, uh, posters, even like quick posts of different examples of, of prompts and scenarios to try out through the the different uh, Office apps from you know Teams, Outlook, PowerPoint, Word, Excel. Uh, so it, it kind of drives that that using the the tool. Uh, so hallucination. So as we think kind of a, a larger conversation around, you know, upskilling our, our users, uh, there is some some communication that we need to do uh, around the how, how these large language models work and, and how AI is going to give you a response uh, no matter what, uh, even if it, it might not be correct. So an example here, and that was just using uh, ChatGPT uh, to, to kind of generate this, but Basically, I said, you know what, generate a, a PowerShell or a, generate some regex that I want to use in a PowerShell script that I want to use to match extension numbers uh, between 3241 and 3279. And what happens is uh, it spits out immediately within seconds some PowerShell code and a breakdown of all the pieces of that code, even some test cases. Problem is that those test cases were, it was basically a lie, right? Like the, the test cases were incorrect. The code is not actually accurate. Uh, if you look at the bottom, uh, what happens is this regex formula doesn't match any number that ends in a zero. Well, in my range, we have 3250, 3260, and 3270 in there. So uh, as I mentioned, we need to understand that you know, AI is there to, to help, uh, but we can't take it at face value. We need to interact with it. We may need to Prompt it a few times, make some manual adjustments, uh, but it uh, it will be it could be confidently wrong in, in giving you some results, uh, and you need to catch that. 
So I think the the key soft skill for for 2024 is really prompting. Uh, maybe and and how do we change the way we're we're speaking to computers? So uh, if you kind of you know some prompting techniques are you know speak to it as if you know the AI is a child. Uh, you know make sure you're giving it a role. Uh, you know what is the task you're trying to complete and, and what is the goal. Uh, the more detail you give in a prompt, the better result, the less back and forth and the less kind of adjustments you'll need and get you a, a better end result. So in this example, uh, I just gave a, a simple one line. Uh, I may or may not use AI to help generate session descriptions, uh, but basically, you know, I threw out some text and then, you know, immediately it gives me pages and pages of content. Uh, I think it was like 10 or 15 different interactions to kind of get it down to something that was a usable uh, session description. Uh, the other example, I gave it just a little bit more information and within one or two uh, kind of interactions, it was, you know, a better end result uh, and it was more accurate to what I was trying to do. So really think about that, those prompting techniques and, and how you can upskill your users to, to prompt the, the AI and co-pilot uh, more effectively. And then think going along with that, you know, I've made a career of uh, understanding how to work with search engines. Uh, you know, hey, take the context of what I'm trying to do in a way that I'll get some results on the first page to give me an answer. Uh, but you're still always doing research, right? You have to find out which links to go into, down the rabbit hole we go, uh, you know, then find, you know, what you're looking for and then apply it to your application. With Copilot and AI, it's really, you know, you could just put your raw uh, code into it, you can, uh, you can explain exactly what you're trying to do and it's going to give you a result it's going to correct your code it's going to give you examples so this is you know much more effective i use copilot as my my coding debugger all the time especially when i'm you know generating new sql queries or maybe working with a language that i don't often work with like maybe JSONnet for syntax and formatting uh definitely a much more powerful tool than than your traditional uh, search engine uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kurt to talk about how we monitor the, the value that we're generating with the use of Copilot. Again, as Dino mentioned, we're committing to, you know, like 360 plus USD of, uh, of licensing costs per user. Uh, but before that, uh, maybe I should also talk about Copilot Lab. Copilot Lab is a great way of uh, improving your prompting. So this is available as part of your Copilot licensing gives you samples and different ways to, to, to build your queries. And then it tells you like, hey, these are the targeted apps that you should try these in. Uh, you can copy these, you can save these. So this is a great resource that you get part of your licensing to, to also upskill your, your prompting techniques. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, so yep. once you've gone through uh, all the steps and checks and balances to uh, deploy a co-pilot, obviously you're interested in what kind of impact this is having in your organization. So uh, I mentioned before, there's a Microsoft co-pilot dashboard. It's a Power BI dashboard that's uh, available for free from Microsoft. And if you've adjusted that setting in your Microsoft 365 admin portal to allow usage data, um, to be brought in to Power BI, you'll get this really nice dashboard. So I'm just going to step through a couple of the key insights which allow you to measure, measure your adoption and the impact in your organization. Um, this is using sample data right now. Uh, if I press this button here, it would connect to my actual tenant and pull that data in. Uh, the sample data is nice because it's all, all filled in and gives us really a really good uh, example organization of what it would look like. Um, before we dive into the impact, I'll just draw your attention to this readiness tab. Um, I mentioned before, how do you identify which users are, um, you know, good targets for your initial copilot deployment? Um, from a readiness perspective, all up after you've done that initial POC, this is a really useful tab because it it summarizes at a tenant level, um, you know, how many of your users have the prerequisite license. Um, how many users are actively using Microsoft 365 apps, which Copilot is um, enabled for? 
So this allows you to sort of uh, just gauge and measure your adoption as you progress along that, that journey. So from an adoption perspective, there's a couple of key insights. Um, we'll just start on the left here. This is a really nice roll up again at the tenant level showing how many active Copilot users have been active in the Microsoft 365 apps over the last 30 days. So this gives you an idea of once you've deployed those licenses, how many of those users that have a license have just been active in the apps where Copilot's available. And then from there, you can get a little more granular. If you go to the right, um, I really like this insight. It's probably the best one from an adoption perspective in my mind. You can actually look at the number of unique Copilot users that have used specific Copilot features in the last 30 days. So for example, here, um, we've had 2,500 unique users summarize a Teams conversation. Um, we've had 2,500 users summarize an Outlook email thread. So those specific productivity gains that Michael alluded to at the start of the presentation, you can actually measure them here inside your tenant. Also, you can, uh, in classic Power BI fashion, you can um, customize all this too to your liking. And there's a couple of different metrics you can drill into. Um, we can change this um, Copilot usage summary from unique users to the actual actions performed by the user. Mm -hmm. So we had 2,500 unique users summarizing Teams meetings. Here you can see uh, that was done 13 times on average in the last uh, 30 days. So this actually gives you a really nice practical usage view of those Copilot features that uh, you've lit up. From an organizational impact perspective, uh, the number one value proposition of Copilot, like Michael said, is save time, be more efficient. So I really like this um, insight because it, it estimates at a tenant level just how many hours you are saving in your organization um, from the use of those Copilot licenses that you have made available to your users. So in this case, you know, it's telling us in the last 28 days, we saved over 14,000 hours. And that's based on a metric that uh, Microsoft is researched and provided. You can uh, read more about it here. But um, the research shows that on average, users say they save about 1.2 hours per week using Copilot. So using that metric and based on the usage statistics, it comes up with this um, number of hours saved uh, in the last 30 days. Now you could uh, argue uh, this is too less or too more or too much, but at the end of the day, I, I really like that is even if it's um, an educated guess, it really does sort of summarize the impact on your organization for for uh, Microsoft 365 Copilot. So that's a, that's a really good thing to have available as you measure the impact in your organization. Um, there's a couple of other things you can do in this um, Copilot dashboard. Um, one of them is you can make surveys available to your Copilot users, and then as they respond to the, the survey, this um, dashboard will actually summarize um, all the user responses. So this gives you an idea how Copilot is being perceived and what the sentiment is in your organization, which is really valuable, right? Because this is a, a new a new set of features, AI features, um, you should be really interested in how your users are perceiving them, whether they like it, whether they actually feel like they're getting value from it. So this feature set can be used to uh, get more insight into that. So that's uh, that's the Microsoft Copilot dashboard in a nutshell. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Dino for, uh, for a wrap. And Kirk, just to just to confirm, it did say Viva Insights on that dashboard. How how does that dashboard license, and how do you have access to it? Yeah, so uh, you don't need a Viva Insights license for that dashboard, um, and it's it's all basically free. There's no additional uh, licensing required. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we hope you enjoyed that uh, our session. Um, please. Uh, provide feedback. The organizers uh, Team Nation have spent a lot of time and effort uh, putting this uh, awesome show on for us. So um, uh, go ahead and um, 
please rate the session. Um, we're going to stick around for a few more minutes to answer any questions anybody might have. If you want to, not sure if it, we're just doing chat or if you want to allow people to come off mute, uh, hands up. But uh, I think Michael is available to, um, to help facilitate that. <clears throat> 